Well, good morning, everyone. I wanted to wish everyone tuning in a very happy Easter weekend. Uh, but I thought before we uh, begin, I wanted to assure you uh, on this very dark day in biblical terms that better days are coming. And there's always a glimmer of hope somewhere if you look hard enough for it. Uh, but sometimes you have to dig deep and then you have to open up your eyes in order to see it. So I wanted to share with you a random act of kindness that was bestowed on me uh, this morning. Um, and it could be, it probably will be, uh, the best part of my day. So this morning I received uh, this uh, from the son of one of our, our finest, one of our Vermont State Police officers, and it's uh, from Sully. So I just thought I'd share this with you. Uh, Sully sent this to me. Uh, he's, uh, I think, uh, about maybe five or six years old. But, um, but I just thought uh, it was nice of him to do, and those random acts of kindness uh, really do uh, make a difference. So, uh, Sully, if you're out there watching, uh, thank you very much for brightening my day and leaving an example for all Vermonters to do something uh, that is, uh, uh, will brighten the day of someone else uh, over the next few days and weeks. So, this morning we have a lot of information to share, so I'm gonna keep my comments fairly brief. As you may have seen earlier this morning, and as I forewarned over the last week, I have extended the state of emergency until May 15th. And this means extending all the mitigation steps in place, including the stay home order. I know, I know how disappointing this is uh, to many as some were hoping we could magically flip a switch and go back to normal. And there's no one who wishes that could be more the case than me. But unfortunately, while it appears we're leveling off, which is good news, uh, we don't have enough evidence at this point in time to show that the virus won't spike. And I don't wanna give false hope or unrealistic expectations. While these are incredibly difficult times and you're making great sacrifices. The fact is, and the data shows, what we're doing is really making a difference. Vermonters are literally saving hundreds of lives by staying home. And it's important we don't let up just yet. Mr. Pichek will provide an update on our outlook shortly, and we'll continue to watch the trends. As I said earlier this week, as soon as the data shows a downward turn or trend, uh, we will open the spigot, just one quarter turn at a time, to get folks back to work in a measured way that's responsible and safe. Until then, we have to continue to stay home and separate ourselves from others to keep from overwhelming our healthcare system, as well as save lives. In this order, we're also providing some additional guidance. Uh, one. Uh, one in particular, uh, this will allow lodging operators to accept reservations after June 15th, which was an issue for them uh, that we rectified. And working with the House and Senate Transportation Committees, I've also directed the DMV to extend vehicle inspections due in April by 60 days. Many have called with concerns about their inspections running out while they're trying to stay in. This order also asks ACCD uh, to make some other sector-specific clarifications. I do understand the significant impacts the steps we've taken over the last five weeks are having on families, the economy, and businesses across the state. I'll continue to work with my team, the legislature, and our congressional delegation to find every tool in the toolbox to help support you during these times. We have a task force uh, looking at additional economic initiatives as we speak in the Department of Labor uh, with the support of several other partners continues to work through the, the backlog of UI claims so we can get money in the pockets of Vermonters more quickly. Mr. Harrington will share more on this in a moment. I again want to thank Vermonters for your sacrifices which are making a real difference in saving lives. I also want to thank the teams at the Agency of Human Services, the Departments of Health and Public Safety, and Vermont Emergency Management, 
and so many others who've been working around the clock for months. As many of you know, unfortunately, we had an, an outbreak at the Northwest State Correctional Facility. Secretary Smith uh, is on the phone to answer, or he's here actually, uh, to answer any questions on that situation. But I wanna take a minute to recognize the dedicated team of public health nurses and the Epi Lab team who worked through the night uh, to test and turn results around for that entire population. While this outbreak is serious, there is no doubt their hard work will help us better address it to keep employees and inmates safe. This is just one example of the hard work of so many and why I know together we will face, fight, and overcome the health and economic impacts of, the, of this pandemic uh, because we're united as Vermonters. So I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichet. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Governor. I'm Mike Pichak, the Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Financial Regulation, uh, and I have been leading the state's efforts to model and forecast the growth of the COVID-19 virus in Vermont. On April 2nd, we provided our first media briefing outlining our modeling efforts and discussing the early results. Today, I'll provide an overview of the developments over the past week. First, I want to reiterate that this situation is very fluid. The assumptions that underlie our models change regularly, and the quality of our data continues to evolve. For example, last Thursday, one model was updated to incorporate actual data from over 40 countries, and that model will be continued to be refined over the days ahead. Last Thursday, we indicated that our early analysis pointed to some glimmers of hope. Mobility data indicated that Vermonters were closely following the governor's social distancing orders and our growth rate showed signs of slowing. Today, those glimmers of hope shine a little brighter. Vermont has seen its seven-day average growth rate fall from approximately 15% to approximately 9% this week. Further, the number of days it has taken for our confirmed COVID-19 cases to double continues to lengthen, initially doubling at a rate of every three days, and then slowing to every five and a half days, and now slowing again to seven and a half days. Due to these positive trends, we reran our model as of yesterday and have updated forecasts that I will now detail. First, as indicated on slide five of our modeling presentation, we continue to follow a positive trend that is below both our worst and even our best case scenarios as of late March. The data now more clearly points to the fact that the sacrifices Vermonters are making and continue to make are positively impacting our COVID-19 experience. Our recent forecast indicates we are trending toward a milder experience during April than was initially anticipated with the new confirmed cases still expected to peak over the next two to four weeks. I must make clear, however, that although we are anticipating a milder experience in April, our current forecasts still indicate that more than 1,000 to 5,000 Vermonters will be diagnosed with COVID-19 by the end of May, with hundreds requiring hospital care. Accordingly, it's still safe to assume that the worst is still ahead of us. The current forecast gives us greater confidence, however, that our hospital resources will be available to Vermonters when those worst days arrive. Slide eight of our presentation indicates we will see a demand for staffed hospital beds ranging between approximately 90 to 233 beds in the weeks ahead, all safely below our current capacity of approximately 420 beds. Further, slide nine points to a peak in ICU bed demand somewhere between 34 and 96 beds during the weeks ahead. This again is within our current surge capacity range of 117 and is trending better than it was last week. However, this point underscores the limited margin of error that exists and the need to double down on our social distancing efforts. 
Slide 10 indicates that our peak ventilator need is trending between 19 and 52 ventilators needed. Again, well within our current available supply of ventilators. This news is positive. However, our future is not guaranteed. The governor's action today was absolutely necessary to ensure we continue on this positive trajectory. The trends can turn on a dime if we stop and relent from social, personal, and professional sacrifices that everyone is making in their daily lives. Again, our individual actions will ultimately determine our collective experience. Although it's difficult, our continued sacrifice will most certainly reduce pain and suffering and save lives. I join the governor in thanking all Vermonters for your continued cooperation and sacrifice during this very difficult time. At this moment, I will introduce Commissioner Michael Harrington. Thank you. Uh, let me just start off uh, by saying uh, thank you to um, the family and friends of our uh, Department of Labor staff who are constantly showing their support uh, during this time for our staff who are working long and hard hours. Um, that helps us uh, go and continue to keep going. Um, and also a thank you to those uh, members of the public who continue to encourage us um, through their words, but also to those who are being patient during this difficult time. Uh, we know it's incredibly hard and incredibly frustrating, and so I, I extend my uh, deepest gratitude for those of you who are trying to get through and can't get through or are waiting to get your benefits. Um, we certainly understand uh, the urgency here uh, and our work on that. I also want to say um, we can do better and we will do better. Uh, and every day we are looking at different ways uh, to improve what we're doing from the previous day. And with that, uh, we've got a number of different initiatives that are ongoing and, and uh, starting even as early uh, as the, today and this weekend to help us manage through this incredibly uh, large number of claims that we're receiving. Uh, some of this has already been shared uh, publicly, but I just want to recap for the people in the room. Uh, as of Wednesday, uh, April 8th, we had received approximately 73,000 initial claims requests. Uh, we've processed, I would say, about 99% of those already. Uh, so they are uh, either in our system or needing special attention from a member of our staff. Uh, we, are, we have some plans to address that, which I'll explain in just a minute. Um, of that, uh, as of Wednesday the 8th, we've issued 38,000 benefit payments in the amount of 23,300,000. Uh, our trust fund balance uh, as of the 4th was just below half a billion dollars. It was $499 million, um, and that will continue to shrink and grow depending on, on debits and credits to that account. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the $600 federal bump that goes on top of unemployment insurance. Uh, those payments started going out this week, and people should begin to see those in their checks um, that are being processed. Uh, uh, this week and going forward. Uh, there is nothing claimants need to do other than continue to file their weekly claims. And I say that because we've had a number of people who opened their initial claim but then did not continue to file their weekly claim. So please remember as you open your initial claim, from that point forward, you need to begin filing weekly claims for each week that you are out of work. Uh, that will ensure that uh, we're processing your payments and, and you're getting your benefits. So let me talk a little bit about the different initiatives we have going on right now. Uh, certainly uh, top of mind and top priority is the standing up of the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Uh, we hope to be able to launch phase one of that next week. That will help provide service and benefits to self-employed 
employed uh, independent contractors and uh, sole proprietors. Again, uh, we hope to have a portion of that live to begin to receive applications as early as next week, uh, and we'll begin processing those payments uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, we are also partnering with a third-party vendor and looking to partner with a third-party vendor, I should say. Uh, we will be uh, putting a bid out today for an emergency turnaround to assist with uh, uh, call center support and standing up a supplemental call center to help relieve some of the volume uh, that is pulling on our staff right now. Um, for example, let me just uh, share with you that approximately 50% of every claim, initial claim that comes in, uh, has an issue attached to it and that issue holds up payment. And so it becomes incredibly critical uh, during this time to devote staff time to clearing issues because it is the issue on the claim that's stopping payment that's causing someone to call our claim center because they're not receiving timely benefits. And so uh, while we want to have someone on the phone answering the calls, uh, we can clear more claims uh, by working behind the scenes and get more payments out the door. So we're hoping that this uh, vendor solution for our expansion of our call center services will allow our skilled staff to focus on clearing issues on claims and, and getting more benefits out in a more timely manner. Um, one other piece uh, that I want to mention is we're launching a series of special internal teams that will be devoted to clearing issues. Uh, and these are groups ranging from 5 to 10 to 12 people, uh, and they are each taking on a series of claims that they will be reaching out to claimants for or answering uh, additional phone lines for simple things like pin resets and status of claims and so on and so forth. So those teams are launching as early as today and will continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Again, uh, right now we have about three uh, different teams that are spinning up at the moment and uh, we will add to those as, as we go forward. Um, we are instituting, and this is an important note for everybody here today and listening on the phone, an alphabetized calling structure. We can give more details for that. Um, it is, we are looking for a, a voluntary compliance. Uh, we will not be um, preventing anybody from calling or turning anybody away, but we are asking the public uh, to help us help you. Uh, we, our system is easily overloaded, our call center is easily overloaded, so uh, we are asking that you uh, voluntarily adhere to this call structure um, so that it doesn't overload our system and crash our system and it doesn't uh, prevent people from being able to get into our call center. Uh, I can share a little bit more about that, but let me just say that our automated claims filing line, which is 800-983-983, 2300 is uh, open uh, all day on Sunday and Monday through Friday from 4 a or 5 a.m. to 4:30 p.m. Uh, and that anybody can call uh, at any time during those time periods. There are no restrictions on that time, uh, and that is an automated phone system for people to continue to file. Uh, if someone is looking to file using our online portal, that is the system that is easily overloaded. Um, so we are are asking for the following schedule to be adhered to. Sunday, uh, anybody can use the portal. Just know that most people try to get onto the portal and that typically causes the portal to go down. Monday, we are looking for people uh, whose last names start with A through E. Tuesday, F through L. Wednesday, M through R. Thursday, S through Z, and because Friday is the last filing day of the period, uh, we are leaving that open for people uh, who need to get their, their claims in. For the claim and assistance line, we're following the this following schedule uh, of Monday, A through E, Tuesday, F through L, Wednesday, M through R, Thursday, S through Z, Friday is open for everyone as well as Saturday. Uh, there are timetables attached to this, so uh, there will be a press release going out following this press conference with more detail, uh, and also uh, it will be posted on the labor, uh, labor.vermont.gov website.
Uh, finally, let me just share that we are providing regular town hall meetings, both for employers and claimants. So the employer town hall meetings are Tuesdays and Thursdays, and the claimant 101 or claimant town hall meetings are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday beginning next week. We've already held a series uh, for this week. Uh, and all of that information is found uh, at the labor.vermont.gov website. With that, I will just conclude again by saying thank you to everybody. We appreciate the support. We appreciate the, pa uh, the patience you have. Uh, and just know that our, our staff is uh, working extremely hard. Um, they are truly committed to what they're doing. And it is incredibly important to them that people get their benefits. So again, thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to the governor. Hi, Mike Smith, Secretary of Human Services. I just wanted to give you an update of uh, what's happening at the uh, Northwest State Correctional Facility. Um, just to review, yesterday uh, we started, uh, we completed testing of all inmates and staff at Northwestern uh, State Correctional Facility. Um, Following the announcement that an inmate had tested positive, we conducted 328 tests that were completed within approximately 24 hours. Uh, we have received uh, some of the test results, 167 of the test results have come back. In the initial round of results, 28 inmates have tested positive as well as five additional staff members. Remember, we had three staff members prior to that. Uh, full uh, test results will be completed today and corrections will be holding a press avail at approximately 2 p.m. to update you on any further information that they may have. Uh, as of last night, we moved 27 of the 28 inmates to the St. Johnsbury facility. Uh, to isolate them while they recover. Uh, currently, these in inmates are not showing symptoms. Uh, the staff will be quarantined and not report to work. The reason between the 27 and the uh, 28, uh, 27 were moved, 28 were tested positive, is that we had one that had a disciplinary issue and we have housed that person in uh, a negative pressure room at Northwestern. Um, there, Northwestern remains in full uh, facility lockdown as we announced earlier this week. And uh, as we announced on Monday, staff and in inmates at that facility were issued masks to wear at all times. And now all facilities have been placed in full lockdown temporarily. Uh, a full lockdown is a controlled measure to mitigate any further spread of the virus throughout the facility and inmates will remain in their cells. Essential services, meals and medication will be brought to them and movement will be restricted except uh, for emergency and hygiene purposes. Additionally, protective masks have been del delivered to all facility and are now being used by uh, staff and inmates. One of the issues that keeps coming up, and I want to address this directly, um, why aren't you testing everyone at all facilities? Uh, the answer, and I'm going to talk about the fact that we're expanding sort of our testing protocol, thanks to Dr. Levine. Um, the answer is we will test as soon as we have reason to do so. Uh, we now have, thanks to luck and ingenuity of Vermonters and hard work, uh, a robust testing system and have pushed the bounds throughout this crisis, we have pushed the bounds of more rather than less testing. We have often gone beyond the CDC guidelines in terms of testing as we have moved forward. But the fact remains that our testing uh, capabilities are not unlimited. And although we would like to test all Vermonters, we simply can't, and frankly, it probably wouldn't give them a, it could give them a false sense of security because this virus can strike at any time. You can test one day and be negative, and then the next day be positive. So with that said, however, 
we have broadened our approach to testing in the last few days to include universal testing for the following institutions, nursing homes, correction facilities, um, those uh, homes that house a sort of a residential disabled and disability uh, facility, residential treatment facilities, assisted living facilities, state psychiatric care facilities, as well as the Department of Health will be issuing guidelines for quarantining transfer of patients from, for example, a hospital to a nursing home, quarantining that patient up to 14 days plus uh, making sure that person is tested uh, before they are moved. So a lot going on on the testing area. I just wanted to um, talk about that up front and, uh, and move forward. Later today, as I said, uh, the Department of Corrections will hold a press avail when we get uh, any updates on numbers from the second round of test results that we're waiting on right now. So thank you. Well, now to open up to, to questions, uh, I would ask maybe Rebecca could let us know who's on the line in terms of uh, some of our team, uh, team members. Uh, we have Dr. Levine on the line, Commissioner Sherling, uh, Secretary Curley, um, Secretary Young, I believe are the folks on the line. Okay. Um, but yes, Dr. Levine, just so everybody knows, is on the line. We're going to start on the phone today and take our first question from Ann Wallace-Allen at VT Digger. Star six to unmute. Hi, can you hear? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, thanks so much. So, um, Governor, this is a little bit of a departure from what you've been talking about, but I wanted to ask you about um, the hazard pay initiative and about, um, in particular, pay raises for state employees. I've heard that some state employees are going to get a 20% raised, but I haven't actually found um, anything, any firm information on that. Do you know what's happening with that? Yeah, I do. Um, I've been briefed on that, but we have Secretary Young on the line and she can give us the exact uh, numbers. Thank you, Governor. I am on the line. Uh, the pay premium uh, for state employees in um, COVID infected facilities uh, it is a 20% premium on top of their hourly rate. So that would apply to um, correctional facilities where there are infections or the surge facility in St. Albans, for example. Um, correctional officers and, and mental health workers and others who are in our 24-7 facilities um, have received a dollar fifty per hour increase um, regardless of whether the facility has the infection or not. What about police? Uh, yes, I believe the state police, again, were offered the same um, pay increases. Okay, thanks. Um, sorry, I have another question, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, as long as the stay in place order is in place, and I know how the fluid the situation is, is there any chance that businesses are gonna be able to open before May 15th? Yeah. On essential businesses? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and uh, while I can't um, I can't promise that, uh, but that's our intention. Again, as we watch the trending, as we watch the graphing and the modeling and so forth, if we can continue to see and have confidence uh, that it's uh, that it's leveled out, uh, plateaued, uh, and then starts declining, that's when we start opening the spigot. And uh, as I said, a quarter turn at a time. Uh, in order to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing, uh, that we're not having any adverse uh, effect on the population, that we're staying uh, within uh, a, a realm of possibility of, of making sure that we don't exceed the capacity of our healthcare system. Uh, so watching that on a daily basis and a weekly basis is going to be important, but it's our intention uh, to do everything we can to get back to normal, but we wanna do it in a safe and responsible way. I guess I'm asking, do you think there's a chance we might actually do that before May 15th? Yeah, I, yes, that's what I think. I, I'm sorry, I thought I answered that. Uh, yes, I, I do believe uh, there's an opportunity to do that. We'll be uh, announcing uh, some of those on a weekly basis as we receive the information. If we continue to, 
to move in a positive direction as we're doing right now, uh, then uh, then we will start uh, opening that up to certain sectors. And okay. again, it's going to be a, a phased a phased in approach. It won't be all at once. It won't be one sector all at once. Uh, it'll be a phased in approach uh, with safety measures in place. Uh, we're going to be asking uh, those sectors to uh, to help us with that, uh, be a partner uh, so that we can get through this safely. All right, thank you. Uh, also just add Secretary French, Education Secretary is on the phone too, I missed him, sorry. Uh, Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, good morning. Uh, this is for uh, Michael Harrington. I'm wondering, uh, Michael, this was a, a big spike in claims uh, given the circumstances. Do you, is your modeling suggesting that maybe we're near a peak, we're at about 21% unemployment rate given that data? Do you feel like we've sort of uh, near a plateau or where do you think that's going? So uh, there are two components to your, your question, and one is if we're talking about the number of initial claims we're receiving um, from the start of this, uh, we have seen um, a slow decline in the amount we're receiving on a daily basis. Uh, at one point, we were receiving close to five or 6,000 claims per day. Uh, now we are receiving somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 claims a day, um, and that can be up or down depending on the day of the week. Um, what this doesn't account for, though, are those self-employed individuals uh, who will begin filing when the new system comes online. Uh, so that will also show an additional uh, spike in the numbers, which will then, again, level off. Um, again, these are just initial claims received. Doesn't mean that all of these people are eligible, but I would guess that most of them are eligible. Um, and so uh, that does show, I mean, we are expecting this to increase over the next week, um, but then we'll see a leveling off. I also just wanted to point out um, when I mentioned the alphabetized schedule, uh, that will be starting Sunday uh, of this upcoming Sunday and, and going forward uh, until otherwise mentioned. Uh, what, do you have an anticipation of where the unemployment rate could get to? I think there's a lot of people concerned about that, obviously. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think at this point it's too early to tell. Uh, I can say if we just take the rough numbers, uh, not doing any analysis, um, the the 70,000 represents about 20% unemployment. But again, um, that's not having done uh, any um, any deep review of those numbers and those claims, um, but again, uh, that would that would may increase. Uh, but it, but I did mention yesterday in an interview that uh, this is a relatively, we'll call it short-term unemployment as opposed to sustained unemployment. Um, so we will we will spike or peak uh, at some point. We will then gradually decline, as the governor mentioned, when businesses uh, are allowed to reopen and people go back to work, uh, and then we'll we'll reach whatever that rest point is there we're getting calls about businesses in a quandary about whether they should um, pay their employees whom they've laid off because they haven't got claims because of the backlog you just mentioned um, as, what I understand is that all the all the claims will be, will be backdated so everyone will receive all the benefits they deserve from that from that point is that correct Correct. Every claim that we receive, um, people will receive benefits back to the date of separation. Um, so if they, if there is a week delay or a two week delay um, or longer, uh, those people will still be, as long as they're eligible for benefits, they will receive the, the full benefits back to their date of separation. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Mike? Okay, going to move to Alex at the Journal Opinion. Hi, uh, thank you for, uh, hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. Mike, I hear you now. Alex, could you hold just a moment? Mike, go ahead. Hi. Uh, Mike Smith, uh, I was just wondering, uh, with the announcement, this seems to dovetail with what the BFCA is asking that all uh, correctional center employees and others uh, be tested. And I was just wondering, what is the plan for these other state facilities to be tested? 
especially correctional centers. And the second part is uh, uh, how many inmates can St. John's Ferry actually hold? Sure. And how long will it be up and up in operation up there? Uh, yeah, good questions, Mike. I, I want to make it clear here, when we're talking about universal testing, we have to have a reason to universal test. So there's got to be a positive case or cases that uh, we react to. Um, without a positive case, um, we may be testing, as I said below, before, for n no reason. We had ample reason to come in and universally test at the correctional facility in Northwest. We have not had staff or inmates uh, uh, test positive yet in uh, any other facilities, uh, but we stand ready to universally test if we have a case or cases within those facilities that I talked about, nursing homes, corrections, uh, disability services, residential uh, treatment uh, facilities, and assistant living facilities. We have approximately 80 beds in uh, St. Uh, Johnsbury uh, that we can uh, that are up and operational uh, that we can staff uh, both with medical staff and correctional uh, people uh, if we go above that we have contingency plans in terms of what we can do at the various facilities as you know Mike we have various facilities uh, medical facilities in our correction facilities uh, for example, Northwest, we have a medical staff there, Northwest, which is housed in St. Albans Town. Um, we, have, we have medical staff there. So we have contingency plans based upon that. But if we have a case, uh, this, is, uh, this is something we haven't done. Uh, if we have a case or cases within the following nursing homes, corrections, those homes with disability or disabled uh, homes, uh, residential treatment centers, assisted living facilities, state psychiatric care facilities, we will universally test those facilities. And again, it's, uh, we are blessed with various Vermonters who have been working extremely hard to make our testing capabilities robust and our ability to test beyond what many uh, recommend, including the CDC. But at the same time, um, we don't have an unlimited supply, so we have to sort of wait for a confirmed test to jump into universal testing, which, which we will do. This is a follow-up. Uh, the court are considering releasing, as a matter of fact, two more inmates were released yesterday. So it seems like it would make sense to actually start testing everybody at the correctional center if the judges are going to start releasing people when they don't even have the information. Uh, they, they seem to be on their own for it as opposed to all that Governor Scott has done is to bring everybody together and moving in one direction. Um, well, why wouldn't you offer that to the judiciary to tell them whether these inmates are testing positive as opposed to just releasing them into the community? I will, I will offer to the legislature, uh, to the courts, that we will test anybody that they plan on releasing um, to uh, make sure. But let me, let me, let me talk about this uh, specific issue because this has come up on a, on a couple occasions, and I want to really sort of zero in. Why don't you release inmates, particularly older ones, that may be susceptible to COVID-19? We have put in place an aggressive effort to release those that can be safely and responsibly returned to the uh, community. And we've established criteria along the way. For example, our population in corrections was 1,614 in February. It is now 1419 as of today. And the reason it is that is because we looked at various policies where we could release uh, those that are incarcerated in a safe manner. Um, for example, during this extraordinary period, uh, DLC relaxed some of the limitations regarding um, where a resident may reside. Now, we put in sort of electronic check-ins, but we relaxed some of the requirements of where they may reside. We also looked at um, the population beyond 
uh, the Senate in, in making sure that those that were coming up on their maximums, that were within their maximums, 60 days within their maximums, that they could be safely returned to the community. But I want to really emphasize this. It's imperative that the crime victims have to be considered in any of our release procedures that we're doing, and we've been doing that as we move forward. You know, many of us said that, um, you know, we should release uh, medical furlough, uh, but that's, you know, advocates and others have called for the medical release of inmates during the pandemic who otherwise uh, are in stable condition, are either elderly or have a chronic illness that, be, that may put them at risk. Um, the commissioner doesn't have that power. I mean, the, the state law is pretty specific right now. It, it's basically end of life sort of situations. And also, if you look at the over 60 population, there are, there are, there are some hardcore criminals in here that we're not gonna release to the public. 101 individuals in our prison population are over 60 years old. Uh, 12 are detained by the courts. We don't have anything uh, to say about that. But in that 12, I mean, two are for murder, one is for attempted murder, three are, are sex crimes, four are sentenced right now pending uh, charges, two for murder, one assault and robbery with a weapon, one sex crime, 86 are sentenced, 18 for murder, attempted murder, manslaughter, 51 for sex crimes, nine for aggravated, ag aggravated assault. These are, these are people that are dangerous to our society. We're not gonna release these people. So, um, Mike, thank you for giving me an opportunity to get on my soapbox on that. All right. Hey, thank you very much. All right, Alex, journal opinion. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Governor, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on the selection of the new emergency order end date. I was wondering if how much of it is just an incremental one month increase, how much of it is epidemiological, how much of it is economic? Yeah, um, probably a little bit of all of the above. Um, trying to give some certainty uh, to uh, people, Vermonters, uh, about what we're doing. Um, I think part of the, the challenge that we all face is we like certainty. We like to know what's going on, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so picking a date uh, for me uh, was to make sure that it was uh, a safe date uh, that, uh, that I believe that we uh, could adhere to. Um, while not giving false hope, uh, but not uh, not signaling uh, that uh, this could go on for a longer period of time. We just don't really know at this point. Um, but think about how far we've come. It was just five weeks ago, six weeks ago, our life was normal. And today, uh, it's far from normal for each and every Vermont or each and every one of us throughout the country. So uh, a lot's happened in a five-week period. My hope is a lot more will happen in a positive way over the next four weeks. So it's just the date uh, that was selected, uh, looking at the, uh, at the, at the graphing uh, when we can hit, hit the peak uh, and then we can start sloping off. I, if, we can, if we can peak, I, I just know uh, that looking at some of the graphing and modeling that it will take as le at least as long to, uh, to slope back off as it did to come to that point. So that's uh, basically it is, it's an un uh, inexact science in some respects, uh, but just trying to give a date uh, that I think uh, is reasonable. Thank you. Okay, Kat, WCAX. Thank you. So the modeling shows that we're below even our best case projections in some respects. So is there concern that not enough people are getting and recovering from this virus and that it will mean we have less community immunity down the line for when the virus kind of inevitably comes back and that we might surge when we then aren't ready for it? Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna let Dr. Levine answer that because some of it uh, is, as you say, I mean, there's a lot of fear uh, that we have uh, that this could all of a sudden spike, um, but there's uh, the science. Uh, I don't think there's enough data uh, to understand whether we build up an immunity or not, or whether we could 
we could get this uh, again or not. Um, so, Dr. Levine, could you uh, venture into this one? Uh, happy to, Governor. So most of what we know about this type of management of viral infection shows that once you get down to the deceleration phase, you will be able to enter this era, era of suppression. And suppression hopefully will go on for many, many months. When you have a period of suppression, uh, that means there are very few actively infected people in the community, and you can then employ strategies of containment uh, whenever some case appears uh, so that you can quickly isolate, contact trace, and then quarantine as needed. This, most, most data shows that there will be another uh, occurrence of viral infection in the population, but that occurrence does not have to be anywhere near to the magnitude of the first go around. Um, and it's a little bit undetermined what that will look like. However, there's still questions about will this virus be as active in the summertime or will warm weather actually have a uh, deleterious impact? Most of what we do, as you've seen in the period of time we've had stay safe, stay at home, is try to um, suppress enough infection so that at this point in time, we're not overwhelming our healthcare system. The same thing, uh, and, it's, and it's a little bit of a buying time phenomenon. So later on, we hope that before that next peak might occur, two things may have happened. Number one, there may be antiviral medication that is actually effective and has gone through the appropriate clinical trials and will be available to the population. And I'll include in that list of medication, not just traditional medicines, but also the question about will plasma of people who've been infected and have antibodies be helpful to those who get uh, ill later on. And then the second thing, of course, is that uh, hoped for uh, vaccine that we know was going to take at least a year to develop uh, and we'll have to wait for. But again, buying time till that point in time when there could potentially be a vaccine for the population to take advantage of. So I hope that answers your question. I have one follow-up then. Um, so if our modeling shows that we're below, you know, our best case projection, um, and we have a lot of this personal protective equipment, when will we decide when we can share that with other states that may need it? Sure. So I could take a, a little guess at this one, and perhaps Commissioner Sherling would also. But basically, um, different states have activity at different times. You've seen that there are some states in the Mid-Atlantic region that are having significant peaks right now, a little bit ahead of where we think our, our peak will be. But there is also parts of the country that have had very little in the way of activity or much more modest experience with the virus, who presumably will eventually reach a, a new stage. So I would think that if we have a prolonged period where we suppress the virus, we would certainly be able to share uh, resources like you've mentioned at that point in time. But I would also wonder if at that point in time, it won't matter so much because there will be more access to PPE uh, nationwide uh, due to a lot of the efforts that are gearing up now, but as you realize, aren't quite ready for prime time yet. Uh, as well, I, I'll ask Mike Sherling to comment uh, here in a minute, but, uh, but I thought I would share as well that we are sharing uh, some of the PPE, uh, some of the N95 masks, for instance, uh, from Burton. Uh, we were directed to uh, New Hampshire as well. Uh, when we receive more of the supply, we'll be sharing with other uh, states in, in the Northeast uh, to make sure that uh, we spread that out and are able to, uh, to help them out in their time of need uh, as well. Commissioner Sherling. Hi, Governor. Uh, I think it was pretty well covered. Uh, I'll just add that uh, as we continue to make our assessments about what the right point in time to be able to share assets is, we have uh, additional work that's going on now to ensure that we're taking into account models of use of PPE, not only by the core hospital facilities and our medical surge facilities, 
but also for home health care workers, uh, for elder care facilities, long-term care facilities, and first responders uh, for whatever posture is going to be necessary to keep them all safe for the next several months until uh, a more permanent solution to the virus is found. So we've got a little bit more work to do before we're, we're able to uh, begin uh, predicting that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Patty LaBeouf, Bennington Banner. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Oh. So I'm wondering, I believe this would be a question for you, Governor. Um, I know some other states, you know, on a here and there basis, sometimes even on a city basis, are suspending evictions. Um, I believe uh, California or Oregon may even have suspended um, rent um, in, in general. I know you had mentioned previously that you were prepared to reduce or to stop evictions or something of that nature if the need arose. I'm wondering, with the fact that many people, as I understand it, have not received their stimulus checks yet, and of course this order being extended so people's places of employment are going to be closed for about a month longer than they otherwise would have, I'm wondering if you have updated your consideration on that, if you planned to do anything in regards to renters um, in the state of Vermont. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, as I stated previously, uh, we're working with the legislature on this. They have a bill that's moving through at this point in time. And if, uh, if I saw that there was a, a need uh, before they could act, uh, that we would, uh, we would place an executive order on addendum to the uh, state of emergency to, t to uh, take care of that. Uh, we haven't uh, heard that I, I know of. Uh, I've asked people to call um, our office, 828-3333 or 211 uh, if they are being evicted uh, so that we could uh, uh, keep it, um, our finger on the pulse, so to speak. Uh, but I haven't uh, been made aware of uh, um, anybody calling uh, about that. But suffice it to say, I, I believe uh, we're working in partnership with the legislature. I believe uh, they are even taking testimony on that uh, today. We wanna make sure that we get this right so that it protects everyone uh, along the way. Uh, but it is, makes it even more important uh, that we uh, work on our uh, unemployment insurance uh, to be sure that we get that in the hands of Vermonters along with that extra $600 every single week. Uh, that will go a long ways in, in helping uh, to pay the rent uh, and uh, to pay other uh, bills, util uh, utility bills and otherwise. So um, we are still, um, I'm still willing to do whatever's necessary to protect Vermonters. Uh, but we haven't, um, we'll continue to work with the legislature, and we haven't seen the need at this point. And Governor, do you happen to know um, the number of that bill or who's sponsoring it so I can look it up? I don't off the top of my head, um, but uh, I believe. But it's about, it's about rent. Governor, I think it's 642. Page 642. Okay, I've just been told it could possibly be H642. I will look up. Thank you. All right, Marcus. WVMT. Governor, based on what Commissioner Pichick said earlier, again, performance being better than your best case scenario, um, and then of course your acknowledgement that Vermonters have been doing very well following the guidance and um, the order. That being said, restaurants have obviously been continuing to do their business based on curbside service and delivery. Why not expect Extend that to other forms of retail, and if you thought about those industries that are especially that uh, do their work primarily outside, like landscapers and things of that nature. Yeah, um, let me take uh, the first part of that uh, um, question. Uh, we have not, in some respects, we have not shut down any businesses. Uh, we have asked those uh, who could become more creative uh, to provide. Uh, for retail, if it's a uh, Walmart or any uh, retail operation that can provide curbside service, uh, we, we are promoting uh, creativity so that they can continue to sell, whether it's online or delivery or whatever it is. So uh, we, uh, we want to, uh, to make sure uh, that retail can, can still uh, continue to, to stay open in some, uh, some capacity. Uh, but what we're trying to do, the goal really is about preventing people from uh, congregating uh, from uh, we're trying to social distance and so that we don't want to create a forum where they come into the store uh, but uh, but I would advocate and if that's been misunderstood 
uh, we want people uh, to be able to sell their, their products, um, but to have to do it in a much different way. Uh, it can contact uh, ACCD uh, in, in order to get cl uh, clarity on that. Uh, and the, uh, the second part, uh, again, uh, the, as far as landscapers and so forth, outside work, those are exactly the types of, uh, of uh, industry, businesses, and so forth that we'll be contemplating uh, in the next few days, weeks uh, to come as this uh, extension uh, to, to May 15th. But as I've shown, we've, uh, we've taken steps along the way since the initial order was placed uh, to increase, uh, you know, turn, turn off the spigot, so to speak, and we'll take the same approach uh, when we are convinced that we're, we're plateauing or heading uh, downwards and we'll start opening that spigot in the same kind of way. So you'll see that we'll be opening up different sectors in different ways and, and probably uh, those businesses outside uh, would, prob would get the first, uh, first attention, I would say. But we just want to keep people safe. Thank you. All right, and I just got a notification from our policy team. The eviction bill is S333, S333. Uh, Greg, yeah. the county courier. Hi. Um, so my question is uh, about the false hope with uh, universal testing. Um, if false hope is given with universal testing, uh, does this mean that you're going to continue universal testing throughout correctional centers uh, at regular intervals going forward? Here's, here's what the, the plan is. And like I said, with those facilities that I mentioned, if there's a case or cases, we will begin universal testing. And to, and to your point, if we feel that it's necessary, I broadcast this the other, or forecasted this the other day, that if we feel it's necessary to go back in there uh, within a certain time period, we will do that as well. Uh, again, uh, given the, the nature of your question, you're, you're absolutely right. There may, be, uh, there may be times where we have to go back in and look at if this has spread even further. So the, the answer to your question is yes. So do you guys anticipate doing regular testing specifically at Northwest? I think you can anticipate that we'll be doing further testing at Northwest. We'll, we'll, we haven't made a final decision on that, but I think you can anticipate that we'll probably do further testing at Northwest. Okay, and uh, follow up I think for Dr. Levine. Uh, with the number of positive tests uh, coming out of say nursing homes or uh, Northwest um, that were asymptomatic, does that indicate that the level of spread through the general public might be much greater than the numbers indicate? That's always indicated that whether you're talking Vermont, another state, or the entire country or world. Um, this is known to be a condition that you know, one person can spread to perhaps two to two and a half people uh, at a time so that any time you have a number you think represents the disease activity in your population, you should multiply that by some other number. It's unclear what that other number will be, but it's almost always greater than the number you think you uh, have. So uh, we do understand, especially in the pediatric population, that lack of symptoms uh, may be the rule as opposed to the exception. In the adult population, we know that it happens or that the symptoms can be mild enough that people don't realize they actually have COVID. So uh, it's always going to be uh, an underestimate of what's really active in the population. Thank you, that's all for me. Thanks for your time. All right, Joe Barton Chronicle. Hello, um, Governor. I understand how the, um, the modeling shows what is likely happening um, given Vermont's actions, but I am curious to know whether it takes into account um, the possibility that um, other states' behavior 
whether they're as cautious as we are or not, might uh, have an impact on Vermont, obviously inadvertently. Um, I'll, I'll let uh, Commissioner Pichak answer uh, the question uh, in further detail, but I but I would I would say yes. I mean the. Just because we have a boundary, a uh, state boundary, doesn't mean uh, that we can't have spread from another state. Uh, and if they are not as cautious as we are, uh, it could have an effect on uh, on the population here. That's why we've taken many of the steps we've done, we've taken in terms of uh, of you know, closing down uh, the uh, inns and and hotels and motels and so forth, uh, B and Bs, uh, to prevent people from other states coming into the state. Uh, to bring um, the infection with them. So, uh, yes, I think that the bottom line is that, but uh, Commissioner Pichek can elaborate. Thank you, Governor. Um, yeah, so Joe, the, the modeling did uh, anticipate uh, some additional uh, number of people in Vermont that were not Vermont residents that came here from uh, New York or Boston or other metropolitan areas that were here for second homes or here uh, vacationing or here maybe uh, spending the winters elsewhere and coming back to Vermont in the summer. So we did anticipate that um, and we did see obviously a lot of out-of-staters being tested positive early on. Uh, so that's incorporated and to your point uh, if Vermont is having a better experience uh, and other states might not be having uh, as good of an experience you do have to keep a close eye on whether uh, individuals would come into Vermont uh, with the disease and potentially uh, spread it here. So that's something we do have to keep a close eye on in the future going forward. Thank you very much. Sean, Chester Telegraph. Uh, thank you. Uh, the town of Chester uh, doesn't routinely chlorinate its water supply, but we understand it was ordered to do so by the state. And this is a closed system pulling from the groundwater supply, just like many Vermonters have at home. And that prompts two questions. If the state thinks that municipal water supplies need to be disinfected, what is the state saying to thousands of homeowners about their water wells? And if home water wells don't need to be chlorinated, why require municipalities to do so? Um, just want to clarify, is this in regards to COVID-19? Yes. This came from the uh, groundwater uh, protection. Um, I, I would have to say that I, I don't have any knowledge of, uh, of requiring a community to chlorinate based on COVID-19. Now, uh, uh, any public water supply has to be tested and chlorinated in a way when you're, trans you know, you're transmitting that to others. Uh, but um, but I'm not aware of anything with COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Levine or any others on the, on the phone uh, have any knowledge of that? I, I do not. Um, I can I shed a little light. This comes from uh, the drinking water, groundwater protection um, from ANR, and it was sent uh, Thursday, March 26th, and it has to do with um, uh, protection of groundwater with COVID-19. I will be happy to, uh, to get back to you on that, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll ask them. I, I haven't, I'm not aware of that. Thanks very much. Neil, Vermont Standard. Hello. Um, I cover the Woodstock area, so lodging is, um, and tourism is a very important thing. Um, you said that you're going to be opening up reservations on June 15th. Yes, with a with a caveat that um, if we determine uh, that we're not out of the woods at that point, uh, that they would have to um, they would have to notify those making the reservations uh, that uh, uh, and cancel those. But um, but at this point in time, we're allowing them to take reservations. We previously uh, shut down the reservation system in its entirety. Uh, but uh, but we are convinced that uh, accepting reservations after the 15th uh, would be uh, helpful to them and in the future uh, because many uh, people are making reservations uh, a year in, adva in advance of, uh, of a significant event, whether it's a wedding or a graduation or some other event. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we provided for that. So... Um 
So you think that by June 15th it'll be safe to have visitors from other states and countries? Uh, again, um, this was just to allow for the reservation with a caveat that if we aren't out of the woods at that point in time, uh, that we could, uh, we will enforce um, them, them uh, you know, the, uh, with the understanding that they might have to cancel those reservations. Uh, I, we can't put a timeline on this, an exact timeline, uh, because it really is uh, the coronavirus that's uh, dictating this. And, and we can't, do, we can control it as best we can, uh, but, uh, but we have to watch them, the modeling and the data. Uh, and that's why it's so important to see, to make sure that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system and that we don't, uh, that we don't uh, um, encourage the, the spread of this disease in some uh, detrimental way. So that's why we're doing what we're doing, uh, taking steps along the way, watching the modeling. And, uh, and if we see that, uh, that it's not working, uh, then we have to close the spigot uh, a bit more. If we see it's working and we're staying under the capacity of our healthcare system and, and everything is okay, uh, then we can open up the spigot uh, uh, an increasing amount. Uh, but the uh, June 15th was really just the date uh, so that they could start taking reservations. Um, is there anything being done to assist, um, you know, these lodging businesses that are, you know, missing a large chunk of their, um, their season now? Yeah, everyone is suffering in some respects. Um, that's why the SBA loans uh, that uh, that have been um, enacted, and I'm hearing that the that Congress is going to take further action on the SBA loans. There was uh, $350 billion dedicated for, to that uh, initiative alone, uh, which isn't probably going to be enough. And I, th I would think uh, some of these entities would be able to take advantage of. So uh, I've heard, uh, and speaking with uh, Senator Leahy last night in particular, uh, he had said that um, that they are going to take action. Um, they are working through some of the details and, uh, and uh, more money will hopefully be on the way uh, for just that, uh, those, uh, those areas of our, of our economy. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, just for everybody's awareness on time, we still have uh, about 18 people in the queue. Taylor, News 7. I have no questions at this time. I give it back to the governor. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Wilson, AP. Um, uh, <clears throat> hi. Um, as always, thank you very much. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is, is a medical question. I guess it's for Dr. Levine. How many patients uh, who have suffered from the COVID-19 would you now consider to have been recovered? And then are you collecting the plasma from those recovered patients and work going forward with that? And then the other question is, um, you're starting to see people say, oh man, this reaction, it was just way too much. It was an overreaction. Look, nothing is as bad as we said it was. I mean, what do you say to those, that, that's for whoever would like to answer that one. Uh, but what do you say to those people? And do you think we're declaring victory too early? Well, first of all, I just want to make sure uh, we are not declaring victory uh, at this point in time. I want to make that perfectly clear. And in, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, and in, in part, um, part and in answer to your other question, um, the more successful we are uh, with, uh, with this social distancing and all the measures we've taken, um, the more it's going to look like we overreacted. Uh, and I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll take the, the blame and the burden of that over uh, the alternative path where we have more deaths uh, than we had predicted. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult in some respects because uh, there will be, uh, there already are. Uh, along the way, uh, there were many people who said, uh, you're overreacting, you shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be taking the, these steps, uh, and, you, and you'll see in the end uh, that, uh, that I was right. And um, they may be right in some respects, but it'll only be because of the, the actions we've taken. Uh, Dr. Levine. I, I concur with everything you said. With regard to the first couple of questions, um, uh, the answer to how many have recovered, I will use the word the majority, 
but we do lack firm data. Uh, but I feel pretty comfortable saying the majority. We know that in terms of people who've been hospitalized um, and have survived, they have um, been listed as recovered by the hospitals, and there's at least 30 of them. Uh, but the majority of people, as you know, do not require hospitalization. And so we have to assume, unless we hear otherwise, that they have recovered. For people who are in the healthcare industry who want to go back to work, there's a very specific uh, definition of recovery, which has to do with the number of days that have gone by since your symptoms began and the absence of fever or the associated symptoms that you were experiencing when you were ill. Uh, and that enables them to go back to work. And we've not been hearing a lot about um, long-term sequela to this viral infection. With regard to collecting the plasma, I would submit that that's premature at this point in time. Uh, we're waiting eagerly and anxiously the results of studies that are being done nationwide on plasma as a form of treatment for seriously ill COVID patients. And until that was really shown to be a plausible pathway to follow and uh, successful and efficacious in the trials without significant adverse effects, I wouldn't want to start collecting plasma routinely from Vermonters yet. But we'll be watching that very closely. Okay, great, thank you very much. All right, Dana, Caledonia Record. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? We can. Yes, great. Uh, this is uh, for Secretary Smith. Uh, sir, um, the expectation of any new cases from Northwest announced uh, later today is the expectation that they'll be transferred uh, to the St. Johnsbury facility. And um, since, of course, we now have positive cases in the St. Johnsbury facility, does that mean that now uh, all staff there uh, facility-wide will be tested? And um, as uh, the bringing of those 27 people uh, to the St. Johnsbury facility has tripled the number of cases in Caledonia County, uh, what assurances can you give the people of, of St. Johnsbury in particular that the virus will be contained uh, in the facility? First of all, if we have additional cases uh, that we report this afternoon, they will be transferred to uh, St. Johnsbury. Second of all, we've, we've done a lot of outreach up in the St. Johnsbury area, both with town officials and state officials, uh, state elected officials up there to sort of discuss uh, what we had planned to do. So we've done a lot of outreach both beforehand and last night to continue that outreach. Secondly, um, we've been pretty open in terms of where uh, these cases would go in a surge capacity sort of, of way. In terms of protection, we will continue to make sure that that facility is locked down in terms of those people that, that are in there, obviously. We have medical staff. We have also set up uh, comfort in um, facilities for those staff to uh, locate if they feel uncomfortable. We'll continue to monitor our employees, and if need be, we'll test our employees there at the facility. We are sort of operating the same way a hospital would operate in that area with COVID-19 patients, that um, we're going to have this throughout the state. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't have borders in terms of what it, what it does. So I would say to the people of St. Johnsbury, we're securing that facility. Uh, we are taking all the precautions that we possibly can. And if we need to test, we'll test. Uh, uh, and we have all the PPE that we need in that facility for, the, for both the healthcare workers and the correctional staff in that facility. Great, uh, thank you, sir. One final uh, follow-up. What is the capacity of the, the St. Johnsbury facility to deal with any inmate patients who require intensive uh, healthcare intervention? Uh, it is 80, and that the capacity is not for intensive uh, health care. We would send them to a health care facility in that case. That would be a, ho that would be a hospital. 
Understood. Thank you, sir. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm just wondering, since Memorial Day weekend is only a couple of weeks after uh, May 15th, should individuals and groups consider canceling their events for that weekend? And I'm also wondering how the state is going to continue to enforce the stay-at-home order if any fines are being issued, and if people don't pay those fines, uh, what are the consequences? Yeah, we're continuing to, uh, I wouldn't say enforce, we're providing guidance. Uh, and we're, we're encouraging and uh, providing education uh, to, uh, to try and uh, make sure that people uh, continue to, to stay home uh, and stay safe. Um, and we've been quite successful at that uh, thus far. Um, Secretary Sherling might have uh, some information on whether any fines have been issued. I don't believe there has been uh, in any organization at this point in time. Uh, in terms of Memorial Day, um, yeah, that's that's tough. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, we'll continue again to provide details. We'll provide this modeling uh, to, on a weekly basis so that the the media and uh, Vermonters know where we stand in real time, and we'll continue to make determinations based on that, uh, based on information, the science, and and the and the best uh, information from our experts as well and take this case by case. So uh, it's my hope uh, that we can, again, uh, pr provide for this plateau, uh, that we'll see a decline, and then we can start opening up uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, the businesses and, and other uh, things that we uh, enjoy uh, throughout Vermont. So uh, it's too early to tell uh, right now, uh, but, uh, but again, there is, uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's just a very, very long tunnel. Mike, uh, okay, thank you. Commissioner Sherling, uh, anything to offer in terms of the, the fines? Uh, no, Governor. Uh, as far as I know, there haven't been any uh, fines issued. The, the complaint levels have been relatively low, uh, just over uh, 120 total uh, complaints. Uh, so, uh, we again, the posture is education. We think that is, uh, is largely working. Vermonters are, are all in on keeping everyone safe. Okay. Uh, may I ask a follow-up? Sure. Uh, so, if somebody does not continue to obey the law, I mean, will they will they ultimately get fined if they don't adhere by the um, recommendations given by the state? Well, that is a possibility. All of those decisions are being vetted by the attorney general's office, so they're centralized. Um, and again, the hope is that whether it's uh, it's folks your your neighbors asking for compliance with the order or it's a law enforcement officer stopping by to ask or if it's the attorney general's office calling that uh that folks uh, understand uh, the public health implications and and will be compliant without the need for a fine and if they don't pay would that ultimately be tied to the driver's license the uh, point a suspended driver's license uh, no, this is not a traffic ticket. It's a it's a, a completely separate mechanism. Okay, thanks. All right, Liz Burlington Free Press. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. We can. Hi, uh, this uh, question is for Secretary Smith. Um, I heard from an inmate in Newport last night, um, just after the lockdown was um, issued, and he was really worried because he had heard a rumor that. Um, inmates from St. Albans were, were being transferred to his facility. And so I wondered if that is indeed happening, if, if inmates from St. Albans are being transferred to other facilities, ones that haven't tested positive, um, but were previously in St. Albans. The ones that have tested positive have been transferred uh, to St. Johnsbury. Um, if uh, I'm not aware if there's been any other sort of transfers that have happened with non-positive uh, uh, inmates, I would I would I will have to defer that to corrections for their uh, for their press avail uh, this afternoon. I just don't ha have that specific knowledge. Um, we did have uh, two tests that were conducted at the Chittenden Regional Facility that was negative. Okay, and I just have a follow-up question. Um, so, you know, given the fact that there are rumors, um, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. 
how is corrections making sure to disseminate information to inmates? Again, I'll leave it to corrections on their, on their uh, news avail this afternoon, but they are developing a plan to make sure that everybody is informed about what is happening. Plus, to be honest, you have, all you have to do is read the news. We've been pretty transparent in terms of what's going on and how things are, are being done. Uh, given what we know, as soon as we know it, we try to get it out as quickly as possible to the public. Well, just, just in response to that, I had heard from an inmate the other day in St. Albans who said he didn't have access to newspapers or the news like he usually did. Um, well, so we'll, we'll, I, we'll, we'll make sure that we step up uh, information flow on this particular virus. Thank you. Dan Galloway, VT Digger. Ann Galloway. All right, Joel Burlington Free Press. Can you all hear me? We can. Oh, great. Um, Governor, it's, it's a pleasure again to, to listen to you update us. Um, I'm interested in the uh, the image of opening up the spigot to commerce and uh, it sounds like there's an encouraging sign for um, for hotel owners and, and inns at least to move things a little bit in that in that direction of normalcy um, I was wondering if and and when you all are going to um, decide on what industries, uh, what other industries might uh, be edging towards normalcy? And I'm thinking, and when when you would decide this, or is there a, uh, a ranking or something that is developing? And also, specifically, I'm thinking um, farmers markets and construction. And if I may just, uh, about farmers markets last friday um, the uh, secretary of ag kept uh, told the house committee on agriculture and forestry that uh, farmers markets that have taken strict health safety measures to remain open like pre-ordering and drive-through and um, minimal contact which is actually more stringent than what grocery stores and supermarkets are required to do. He, he said they could remain open following the model of the Bennington uh, farmer's market that seems to have successfully modeled that. So uh, I was wondering the status, if you could outline the status of farmer's markets going forward, uh, given what uh, Secretary Tebbets has told us. Uh, and um, what's in store for the construction industry? Thank you. Yeah, uh, you hit on uh, probably two sectors that uh, we're thinking about at this point in time and how do we responsibly open those up to the general public. Um, I, would, I would say in terms of farmers markets, uh, they are uh, of course important uh, to the supply chain, important to uh, the food supply to, uh, to Vermonters. And, um, and we want to make sure that they open up as soon as possible. Uh, but I would, I would also offer uh, that uh, those individuals are not prevented from selling their products from their homes and so forth, or their, biz uh, their place of the business, as long as they have a curbside service there. Um, if you compare them, uh, and we've had this debate, we've talked about it a lot, and, and it, you know, you wondered when, when do we start thinking about it? I think about this uh, almost every hour of every day. Uh, how are we going to open these businesses back up and get back to some sort of normal? And so um, when you think about the farmers markets in particular, uh, and I know uh, some have uh, uh, conflated those and, and, and compared them to like a, a major uh, food uh, supply uh, grocery store of some sort, 
they aren't the same uh, because you have individuals uh, who are selling, you know, maybe two or three at one individual station selling uh, their product. And then you have another one uh, just 20 feet down, two or three uh, people selling uh, again uh, to an individual. Whereas in a grocery store, uh, you have uh, probably uh, one person for every 50 or 100 people uh, who come through the store. So it's a much dip different atmosphere. So if you think about what our goal is uh, to make sure that we don't uh, congregate uh, in and in over congregate, uh, we separate uh, and distance ourselves, uh, that's part of the goal, both for uh, those uh, in uh, uh, for the workers uh, in those businesses, as well as uh, for uh, those um, consumers. So that's been our thought process, but but that is on on the uh, the, the list of um, trying to find a way uh, for them uh, to to open back up, as well as in the construction industry. But but keep in mind, uh, this will not be a flip of the switch. We will not be saying to the construction industry, uh, for instance, uh, that you can go back to work tomorrow. Uh, we're going to uh, provide for a phased-in approach of some way. We're engaging with the contractors, engaging with uh, with those uh, in the uh, farmers markets to provide uh, some sort of uh, a method uh, for opening back up in a responsible manner. So uh, I think I answered everything, but uh, but if I didn't, I can no, that, get back to you. That is very helpful. It sounds like uh, it's a work in progress and. I know a lot of people who are uh, waiting with bated breath in all number of industries to to see how they might uh, comply and and um, you know meet meet the standards that are in place. Yeah, nobody maybe more. even pioneered. I mean, it sounds like some farmers markets have pioneered uh, pre-ordering. <laughs> so it's not a, it's, they're not haggling over a cucumber. They're actually picking up a box or yeah. having it popped in the in the back of a pickup truck. Yeah, so, and, and I think that's um, going to be the approach as we open these back up in many different ways, thinking outside the box. It's not going to be in the, the normal fa fashion. Uh, and I would just add, uh, there's nobody more anxious than me uh, to open up the economy uh, so we can get back to normal. But yeah. again, I want to make sure that we do it in a very responsible and safe manner. All right. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. Um, we have about 10 uh, questioners left and we are about an hour and a half into yeah. this so just everybody for awareness uh Brittany, local 22. um so my question is in regards to the cares act um the new york times came out with an article yesterday that says uh, a lot of small businesses aren't getting the loans they were promised they were promised up to two million and they're only seeing about fifteen thousand of that so my question is just, have you been in contact with the federal government and the authorities, um, and can Vermonters rely on the CARES Act? Are they going to get the money that they were promised? Well, I, I, I'm going to refer to someone from Commerce, but I, I will add, uh, we had this conversation last night with uh, Senator Sanders, Senator Leahy, Congressman Welch, uh, and we certainly all have the same goal. We want to make sure that there's a path forward for anyone needing money. So. With this next uh, provision in the CARES Act, uh, I would say uh, if there's improvements uh, that need to be made, uh, they're all, all ears. Uh, they want to help. Thank you. Hi, this is, hi, this is Secretary Curley. Um, you know, just to reemphasize what the governor said, um, Vermont lenders are reporting that they um, uh, received applications that were submitted and approved loans to the tune of 3,500 just in this week alone, and they are hearing, you know, what you're, what you're suggesting as well. And so we've been in communication with the congressional delegations on this. And um, what we want to just remind people is, um, not every product is the right product necessarily for you, and um, and we know that you need to get guidance on that. And we want to issue or help help you with that guidance and offer some technical assistance. Um, but again, if folks can um, get in the queue and, and get their applications and hopefully as maybe more money is approved in some of these programs are tweaked um, to, to correct some of the fixes that, that need to happen, um, we'll be better off down the road. Thank you. Call in seven days. Uh, 
Hi, this question is for Secretary Smith. Um, so you had referenced some hardcore criminals when you were talking about not releasing people from prison. I was just wondering if there was, um, what about people who might be pre-trial pre or in their parole violations? I mean, is this still something you're considering um, further limiting the prison population, or do you feel like you've gotten it down as far as you can? We're always looking at getting the prison population as, uh, in a safe and responsible way, getting the prison population down as far as we can. Like I said, it's 14, uh, uh, 19 today. That's, that's quite low as over a historical time of what our correctional facility has been. I think a couple of years ago, I saw something that we were over 1,700. So we are looking at different ways, Colin. Um, I will say this, um, I think we're getting towards the end. There may be a few more opportunities, but I think we're getting towards the end. As I mentioned before, we're not going to release those people that I had um, sort of singled out in terms of sex offenses, in terms of murder, aggravated assault. These people are violent, and we're not going to let, let them out of our uh, correctional facilities. But um, we're always looking for opportunities with the proviso that, one, we contact the victims, and two, it's safe and responsible to return these people to um, the public. Pam Davis, Vermont Journal. Uh, I've got a question. I've been curious about uh, the question of whether there's going to be a second spike. It's come up several times. Uh, it has to do, it obviously has an effect on how just people generally think about it, but it also would affect the governor's plan to uh, uh, to start opening the spigot. Uh, if the would obviously get, obviously get would have a, there would be a problem with that if you had a second spike. I'd like to ask uh, doc, uh, Dr. Levine to just say a little bit about the biology of this. When we talk about a second spike, are you talking? Are you do you contemplate that the that what we'd be looking at would be um, a uh, a either a new vi a mutation of the uh, COVID-19 virus, or you suspect the risk spike? is coming from latent uh, COVID-19 that just has, is just still lurking out there in the population. Sure, Ham. So I'd like us to get away from the term spike, because when I think spike, I think of that horrific curve I showed in the very first time I brought uh, a prop with me and showed how the healthcare system would be overwhelmed because it was a steep increase to a very high number. So I would prefer to call this uh, uh, a period of reactivation of disease activity. Um, and, okay. and that might be uh, a much, much milder uh, curve than the one that I've envisioned for you. Um, you know, there's things being learned about mutation all the time, and right now mutation is not at the top of the list of things that people are concerned about. And I think that's because of experience with prior coronaviruses that have affected humans that really can reinfect them, causing mild illness, but don't uh, reinfect them because they've mutated necessarily. So I think this would be an area where there would be a time period of, as you called it, latent disease. And after that period of latency, there was some recurrent activity of disease in the population which again, we would hopefully be able to address with more of a containment strategy and not have to rely to the extent we are currently on the mitigation strategies uh, that we're employing. Uh, thank you. Can I get one more question? I'm curious whether uh, given the still limitations of the amount of reagent available for testing, whether you're, you've thought about it all or whether it's, it's even relevant whether you should begin to look for a serum test and just looking for antibodies. Has, has, has that been discussed at all by your team? All the time. Um, and I get questions about it all the time. And um, I, I will just say that if they are, in a, if they are in the discussion, we would like to find one that actually has uh, sufficient accuracy that we would find it trustworthy and that the results would give people confidence either if they were positive or negative. 
Um, and we would also like to employ them at a more ideal time. And when you're still uh, in a very significant period of virus activity in the population, we would much rather rely on the PCR testing of uh, nasal and throat secretions that we're using currently. But in that period where things have, as they're called, decelerated and there's less disease activity, that becomes a more ideal time to begin using these serologic tests on the population. Thank you, sir. Peter Hirschfeld, oh, BPR. Secretary Smith, um, you said you were going to hold off on universal testing in correctional facilities until you have a confirmed case. Um, by the time you had one confirmed case at Northwest, looks like based on uh, test results so far, 20% of the inmate population had already contracted COVID-19. Um, why not do more surveillance testing in the inmate population to avoid a similar outcome in other correctional facilities? I wish I had all the tests in the world, Peter, uh, but we don't. Uh, we have a robust testing procedure, but we don't. I want to clarify something you just said. We had three staff um, test positive, uh, excuse me, that were tested uh, for COVID-19. The first staff member was outside of the facility and didn't have direct access to the facility. The next one um, had actually uh, was uh, called out six on March 26, was administered a test. That test came back negative. Unfortunately, that person took a turn for the worst after that test, but did not return to the facility. And then the third uh, inmate and then the, uh, the third uh, correctional officer and the inmate almost happened within 24 hours. As soon as we saw that, we started testing. We started universal testing. Um, but, I mean, to get to your, to your question, uh, why, don't we just, uh, why don't we just start universal testing no matter what? I wish we had that type of capacity. We have robust capacity. We don't have unlimited capacity. Okay, Kit Digger. This one's for Commissioner Harrington. I just wanted to touch back. I know you, you outlined some of um, what you're doing to increase uh, the call center uh, capacity. I was just curious if you could get into what is the hope for uh, how many uh, folks you will get on to answer calls and how much, if you know yet, um, that could cut down on the number of calls going unanswered? Uh, I, <clears throat> I wouldn't be able to provide that. Uh, I can look at traffic uh, into the call center. I can tell you how many we are answering, but many people are trying over and over and over again, and there's no way to know um, whether someone tried five times or 100 times to get through. Uh, our expectation or, or hope is that with this um, secondary uh, call center uh, being stood up over the coming days, um, that it may have as many as 30 uh, staff people manning the phones, but I will say that that will allow the, the 20, 25 people that we have answering lines right now to redirect um, towards uh, clearing those issues, which I said probably 80%, if not more, of the calls we receive right now are because a claim was stopped because of an issue. So again, th there's, um, there's two components going on here. One is uh, redirecting staff to clear issues more quickly um, to reduce the number of calls coming in, um, but also standing up a new site to be able to help with the, the just the high volume of calls. Does that answer your question? That does. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, do you expect that just this additional call center will be uh, enough moving forward to deal with the increase in, um, in, in claims? 
Uh, I do because I think, again, uh, the volume of calls will go down as the number of issues clear. Um, so the only people who are really calling our claim center because they have some piece of follow-up that has to happen, people are still able to file their initial claim online via the web, and then when they file their weekly claims, they're able to do that through the automated phone number and, uh, and on the web as well. So as long as there were no issues on a claim, a claim could literally be opened and someone could be filing weekly and receiving payments without talking to anybody face-to-face uh, -face or over the phone. Um, but again, of those claims that have an issue, maybe there was a bad piece of information, maybe we need a little more detail, uh, maybe there was an incorrect um, uh, Social Security number given, there's a variety of different reasons that issues occur. Uh, and so again, as we clear those issues, um, the call volume is expected to go down. And with the pandemic unemployment assistance program, I, you know, we're constructing that system so it's as much self-service as possible. Again, reducing the, the number of people who would need to call in and talk to an actual person. Okay, Avery, WCAX. This question is likely for the governor. So talking about travel, um, once this stay-at-home order ends, do you foresee that people will be able to travel out of state without having to quarantine when they return? And the second question onto that is, what do you say to people who maybe have larger events like weddings and things already planned for later on in the year? Yeah, those are uh, two great questions and, and something I don't have the answers to other than uh, we hope to get to a point uh, where we don't have to ask people coming into the state to quarantine or self-isolate. Um, that would be our goal. Um, and at the same, so we're going to try and mitigate that and, and trying to prevent that from happening by um, staggering or some some sort of phasing of the inns and hotels, motels, bed, bed and breakfasts and so forth uh, so that we uh, prevent uh, anyone from having an excuse to come to Vermont. Uh, so. All this has to work together. Uh, state parks, uh, private campgrounds, all the above uh, have to be worked together in a phased approach uh, so that we don't overwhelm uh, the system. Uh, normally, we'd be, we'd be asking people to visit Vermont. I mean, this is uh, counterintuitive to everything that I've stood for uh, in terms of the economy. I couldn't imagine. I mean, you know how much I talk about the economy and growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable and so forth. Um, who would have thought that we'd be in a position uh, we are today where I'm discouraging people from visiting here. Um, but um, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll get to a point uh, where we can, uh, we can go back uh, to where we were in some uh, capacity and uh, start welcoming people back in. In terms of uh, the weddings and so forth, uh, I just don't have the answer. It's just a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month decision-making process where we can open that spigot back up. What about out-of-state travel, Governor? Uh, in terms Are people of, starting to be restricted in that way? As far uh, as going to maybe like hot, what are now considered hot spots, I mean, that could change. Yeah, I, I would say everyone's in the same position uh, throughout uh, the country. I, I can't imagine any anyone is promoting anyone leaving their states at this point in time. But again, uh, this is going to change based on the data, uh, the modeling. And uh, what we see, I mean, if, we, if other states are, I'm seeing some, some success stories in other states as well, hopefully we'll get back to some normalcy. But imagine a future, uh, who knows, I've, I've made the statement the other day, we learn uh, from uh, any crisis we've experienced. And after 9-11, we brought the TSA. Um, increased testing is going to be part of the future in some capacity. And it's going to be more instantaneous. And I don't know what it looks like. Uh, but uh, but if we can have quick tests where we're preventing people from uh, when they're traveling, uh, getting on an airplane or getting on a bus or getting on a train and take a quick test to make sure that they're they're not uh, positive, uh, then that will probably be part of the of the future. But but I don't know how to how to attain that. I just know that testing is growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, hopefully uh, that'll be part of the, the solution as well as the vaccines. Uh, that we'll see in the future. And I know everyone is working uh, day and night uh, to try and accomplish both. Okay, thank you, Governor. Emily, VPR. Hello, 
Emily? Hi, this is another uh, question for Secretary Smith. Um, can you clarify if, if inmates do need uh, intensive care, will they be going to hospitals or will the National Guard be involved instead? No, if they need intensive care, they're going to hospitals. Okay. Well, I have heard um, uh, um, Jim Baker talking about the National Guard building some kind of medical unit at St. Johnsbury. What is that about? That you're going to have to talk to Commissioner Baker about more of the details about that, but that would be in reserve if we needed something in reserve. Okay. And then a second question, my, my last question, um, on the same uh, you know topic that you've already discussed, I'm I'm hearing from inmates who have um, medical conditions that are specifically they've passed their minimum. They're waiting for programming. That programming began. Now it's canceled. They're essentially. Um, incarcerated for programming they can't receive. Um, I was wondering you know, if you have any response to that particular scenario, but more so if you could describe what is the process by which DOC um, decides which inmates it can release? Emily, the uh, process is um, what I had described earlier in terms of uh, the various things that we've done. I mean, there is a process that has been um, age old in terms of what you go through for releasing, uh, for getting released out of uh, corrections. But in these COVID-19 uh, times, we have, um, I, I would say, uh, enhanced that process. Again, we've re-examined and loosened uh, restrictions to offenders re-entering re the community, and specifically things like during this extraordinary period, DOC has relaxed some of its current limitations regarding where an inmate may reside upon re-entry. And there's a, there's a whole host that uh, corrections can go through on what that means. I, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six bullets bullet points on that. They've also looked at scanning their population, as I had mentioned before. A DOC has reviewed previous uh, decisions denying furlough in cases where the offender will max out within the next 60 days and looked at these cases uh, individually. They've also um, made sure that, again, when they're doing all this, they've looked at um, uh, the victims and how does this affect victims and fully inform victims on a pending release. So they not only have they instituted guidelines that have been uh, I would say well established during the times. We have instituted guidelines that increase, um, that have been sort of uh, been done during this time of uh, COVID-19. I want to I want to also address your other question. Look, we're in, we're in unprecedented times, and certain things that we did during pre-COVID times. We can't do during COVID, this COVID period time. We'll return to normalcy as soon as we can. But during this time, people have got to realize that none of us, none of us here in, in this auditorium, none of most people that are watching on TV, none of us have ever experienced this. And what we are doing is trying to be fair, trying to be consistent, trying to be responsible and safe as we look at the prison population here in Vermont. And the mere fact that we've gone down from 1,600 and some odd, uh, 1,679 to 1,419 uh, shows that we are doing this in a responsible way. Okay, it's, it's one o'clock and I know um, at least the governor, probably a lot of other people on this have a meeting, so I'm going to have, we have three more. Um, please, if you have any corrections questions, there's going to be another press conference on that today, and perhaps that could just be taken offline. Um, and just please, one question, if you need a clarity, that's fine, but not multi-part multi questions. Aaron Digger. Aaron from Digger. All right, Stuart. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Aaron. Okay, I'm uh, sorry about that. 
Um, yeah, and thank you for uh, taking this time to answer the questions. Uh, yeah, it's uh, been a long press conference. Um, my question is um, about the, uh, the modeling that was released today. Um, you know, many of the things that you're modeling right now are things that we're working on getting surge capacity for, like ICU beds, ventilators, PPE. Um, so one thing the state is also trying to work on getting is more healthcare workers. Uh, but there's no model of um, how many healthcare workers there are, how many uh, we are working on getting due to you know surge planning, and uh, whether that's going to be enough under these different scenarios, these different um, models that the state is putting out. So, um, what can you tell me about the data the state has for that, and um, are you planning to release any of that data in the coming week? I'll let Secretary Smith uh, answer that, but I, I can say that there's a lot of competing interests uh, out there in our neighboring states. New York has put out a plea and uh, and, and quite uh, lucrative in some respects for healthcare workers, so it's challenging uh, across the industry. And we were challenged before uh, this uh, this COVID crisis, so um, it's uh, it's become more and more of an issue, and it's something that, that literally keeps me up at night if we uh, had a surge. Uh, to have the personnel, because we can have all the hospitals, all the ventilators, all the PPEs in the world, um, but if we don't have the personnel, um, then it's all for nothing. Aaron, this is Mike Smith. Um, during, when this first started, when I started seeing the worst case scenarios, that was uh, the nightmare scenario for me, is making sure we had enough people. If you look at the models right now, those are staff beds, so I'm feeling um, a lot more confident in terms of our ability to do that. Plus, on top of that, we have uh, all of those capabilities that we have at the Champlain Valley Fairground, uh, at, um, at Patrick Gymnasium, and the capacity that we have at the, at the Rutland facility, at the rink at Rutland. I will say um, that we are always on the lookout for nursing and medical care people uh, as, we, as, as we move forward with this. So there is a, a volunteer website. Um, I, I don't have it on me. Maybe Mike Sherling does uh, in a moment. But uh, I would say that we're always on the lookout for medical care in case um, you know, things uh, don't progress the way the models are. But right now, the, the things that the governor have put into place uh, have given me uh, at least one hour of sleep at night in terms of what we're looking at as we move forward in terms of beds, in terms of staff beds, in terms of ventilators, in terms of all those things that we were looking at in March that um, just kept us awake. So thank you. The website is vermont.gov slash volunteer. All right, Calvin. <clears throat> okay, so um, I think this might be a more question for um, Commissioner Harrington. So you mentioned that this is going to be a relatively short unemployment period. Um, how sure are we of that? And what about uh, businesses that may not bounce back? Yeah, so um, it, I use the term short in relative terms. Uh, when we look at um, unemployment numbers and historic unemployment numbers, those are prolonged periods of unemployment. Um, so again, uh, we're seeing this um, incredibly large spike in unemployment. Um, but again, we also know that in many cases that's that's temporary. Um, it will not be temporary for all. Uh, and so um, I think we will see uh, once businesses begin to reopen and, and bring staff back to work, uh, a steady decline. Um, but I think it will be a while before we go back to pre-COVID-19. I don't have the ability to foresee that at this point, but um, it certainly won't happen all at once. Uh, and I think it will take us a while to even get down to where we were at 2.4%. At I just don't see that happening for a while. Um, but yeah, so it'll be a, a long process. And just a quick follow-up, I guess, for the viewers, just so people can have a recap. Do we have a, any sort of numbers as to how many cases and uh, tests positive we have as of yet? I mean, in general, uh, in the general. overall population, I think it's on our website, but. Uh... Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll ask Dr. Levine to sort of uh, 
make sure I've got the numbers right, but I think it was uh, 51 last night, and that includes the correctional facility for a total of 679. Dr. Levine, can you uh, verify those numbers that I'm right? Those are correct. We just have one more question. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, stop down. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mike Malowski with True North Reports. Um, since we now have a crisis of 70,000 Vermonters out of work, and since the models for COVID deaths have proven to be greatly overestimated so far, will your administration now consider using a targeted strategy of mandating social distancing for vulnerable populations while allowing the rest of Vermonters to get back to work? Yeah, you know, that's our goal, is to get Vermonters back to work, and that's why we're putting all these steps into place, and we're doing it in a responsible way. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that the modeling that, uh, that we've put into place is going to continue uh, to show uh, the positive steps that we've taken are ha making a difference. And, uh, and so if we continue down this path, obviously we'll start opening business up just as quick as we can. Again, there's no one more anxious than me uh, in doing so. And um, um, what was the other part of the question? Um, would you consider targeting the social distancing at the specific vulnerable populations, older people? people well, again, again, I don't think it's just, you know, the, the social distancing uh, adheres to all of us. Like, it, this is transmitted uh, whether you're um, uh, 15 or 75. Uh, it doesn't matter your age. It's just that you're more vulnerable with chronic conditions uh, and having an adverse effect as a result of uh, contracting coronavirus. So um, all of us uh, have a role to play in this, uh, all age groups. So to just, just uh, to, to concentrate on one sector uh, just wouldn't be beneficial. Uh, Dr. Levine, anything you should, I should add to that? No, I think that's well stated. You know, in the end, we're all vulnerable uh, and though we, targeted a certain group as being the most vulnerable. If you have widespread disease in the population, people who don't fall in the older, chronically ill, vulnerable group will get very ill, just statistically speaking. So uh, the strategy is population-wide. It can't really be targeted in an effective way. Okay. All right, we gotta go. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, have a good Easter, but do it in a responsible way. Thank you very much.